Welcome to the Elvis Presley channel. Gladys Presley had once been a vivacious and fun-loving girl, but after all the family losses, Elvis's mother poured all the love into her only son. But when he became successful, she withered in the intolerant glare of the spotlight. Why Elvis Presley's fame was a curse for his mother. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Elvis Presley channel. Gladys Presley, the mother Elvis Presley worshipped. Elvis Presley is known as the king of rock and roll and a generous man who loved giving back to the community, and it was his mother Gladys Presley who taught him to be a great man. Gladys Love Smith Presley was an endearing, spiritual and compassionate lady, a good Christian, a devoted wife, who suffered a great deal in her brief life. Her life was all about protecting her only son, but his success made her lonely and depressed. The daughter of a cotton farmer brought up and comfortable in her narrow spiritual world, and soon to be placed in the unimaginable position of being the mother of a globally adored son, it was no wonder that she couldn't share his only love, his son, with his globally dispersed fans. Assuming herself lonely, she couldn't survive and left her son in grief, but we hope the only thing she knew for sure was that her son Elvis loved his mother immensely. Gladys Love Smith was born on April 25, 1912 in Mississippi, and grew up far away from the luxuries and fame that her son Elvis Presley later achieved. In the 1930s, the daughter of a farmer fatefully met Vernon Presley at a church, and Gladys Smith and Vernon Presley eloped on 17th of June 1933. Both young partners lying about their ages got married in the county of Pontotoc, where nobody knew them. While sustaining their livelihood with minimal earnings, they welcomed their first and only child. Gladys gave birth to two boys, Jesse and Elvis, but the former was a stillbirth. She became extremely protective of her only surviving son. Gladys was near death after the delivery, so she and Elvis were rushed to Tupelo Hospital. Once she came back home, everyone observed that she is overprotective of her newly-born child. She was scared that something tragic might happen to him. Despite all the financial crisis, they made sure to provide the best for their child. Unfortunately, Vernon was accused of forgery in 1937, along with his brother-in-law, Travis Smith, and sentenced to three years in prison. Financially unstable, Gladys moved to live with her in-laws and later with relatives. She was alone carrying the responsibility of a child. She lost her house. In that tough period, she even had to get help from neighbours and the government for getting food. Young Elvis got a singing talent, but he was quite shy about his performance abilities, and as he got older, they went on to shift around. Finally, in 1940, Vernon was granted an indefinite suspension of his sentence. Gladys's husband bought a new house for his family in 1945 after completing his prison sentence. Elvis's teacher had already observed the legendary singer's talent around this time. While Elvis was known to be close to both of his parents, it was obvious that he was closer to his mother, who was, by many accounts, the family's most influential member. They went to Memphis, Tennessee in 1948, and after nearly a year in boarding houses, they got a two-bedroom apartment in a public housing complex also known as council housing in the UK. Elvis's shyness persisted, but Gladys's fears further restricted him. During World War II, while Vernon was away helping to build a prisoner of war camp for the WPA, Gladys was admitted to the hospital. The truth is, she had a miscarriage that time, and Gladys never had another child. She had tried, and unfortunately failed. So she gave her best in the upbringing of her only child. During an interview with New York Daily Mirror in 1956, Gladys and Vernon Presley talked about the upbringing of Elvis. Gladys Presley was pleased with how they taught their son. He was raised well, she said. He never lies, he doesn't swear, I never heard him call anyone anything except Mr and Sir, and we taught him if he can't help a man out of a ditch, the least he can do is say a prayer for him, and the Lord will never let him fall. And we always taught him right from wrong, as far as we knew. Interestingly, if you look at their life history, Gladys did not have a strong role model in her mother, and Vernon did not have a strong bond with his father. Gladys was 23 when her mother, Dole Smith, died in 1935. 
Gladys, one of eight children, never went to school, and Vernon didn't graduate either. They would barely read and write, and that was the reason they always wanted their son to have a proper education. They were poor. Gladys would walk to work most often, because she had no car. Several times they hardly had any lunch money to give Elvis. However, they had food to eat and clothes to wear, and a roof over their heads. Perhaps they got loans, but they did everything for their son. Gladys was blessed with a son who always listened to her. When Elvis was fifteen years old, he was passionate about football, but Vernon and Gladys tried to stop him from playing football. After school, the white boys would team up against the coloured boys. They'd come home with their clothes torn and their hides too. Being overprotective parents, they didn't want him to get hurt, but he wouldn't stop. Gladys was working in the hospital then, and one day a boy was brought in from a football game, and he died of a blood clot. That scared both of them, and they made Elvis quit. And the thing that Gladys heard from a fifteen years old Elvis was wholesome to her. He said to his mother, "I will stop because I don't want to worry you." In an interview at the time, Elvis was already a star. Vernon recalled that the family always talked things out. We have always been able to calm him, to talk to him about everything, except maybe his dates, and then we could talk to him if they were the wrong girls, and he'd listen. He'll say something about a car he'd like to buy, and I'll say I wouldn't, son, and he'll listen. Even now he obeys. After being a star, whenever young Elvis Presley walked on stage, girls would scream with excitement. He knew how to grab the attention of the audience, even without his legendary hip gyrations. Sometimes he would stop and just stare at the audience, and the longer he did it, the more the girls would scream. His drummer D. J. Fontana once noticed other strippers doing a similar trick, but to Elvis, it was all just a tongue-in-cheek game. Why, for her mother? Because he never wanted to be a cause of embarrassment to her mother at any point, he explained when asked, "I don't think I do anything obscene on stage or anything that would embarrass my mamma. I really don't." This might not have sounded true to all jealous men watching those overexcited girls. But Elvis meant every word of it. Gladys was that one lucky mother whose four-year-old son desired to buy a big house and luxury cars for his parents some day, and he actually made it happen. While in high school, he took jobs in the afternoon to help his parents make ends meet, and even when he was in school, he'd go around and pay the grocery bills of twenty-five and thirty dollars. Gladys never asked him to; he'd just do it himself. Once Elvis got his father to buy him a lawn mower and used it to make himself eight dollars a week. But eventually, his singing talent made him a star, and he could fulfil all his promises and did everything for his beloved mother and father. But you know, from where did he start? Elvis Presley started his career with a birthday gift for Gladys. Yes, the first song he ever recorded was for his mother Gladys. In 1953, at the age of 18, he went to Sun Studio in Memphis to record "My Happiness" as a birthday gift for her. That record proved to be a spark, which would eventually flare into superstardom. And then, at the age of 19, his record "That's All Right" got played on the radio. Gladys said she was so shaken by hearing Elvis's name spoken by the DJ that she couldn't hear the song. You can think of it in two ways. Naturally, she was excited and proud. But she was also scared. After all, the last time she heard her husband's name aloud in public would have been when he received his jail sentence. Gladys smelled something dangerous about being exposed in this way, and she could never control her fears after that. The most sorrowful moments of Gladys's life started to emerge shortly after the music star became famous. Yes, she was proud of her son, but everything was happening too quickly that Gladys found his fame difficult to handle. She was enjoying the attention he was getting. He got an amazing talent, and that's what she believed all her life. So why wouldn't she be happy? She never knew how it would feel to see her son as a public figure. When she saw him going off to engagements out of town, she was uncomfortable. Gladys was reportedly so frustrated by her son's female fans that after one concert, when girls came close around Elvis, she pushed them away from her son. She allegedly never got used to having to share her son with others. That new life started to frighten her. The woman who lost her parents at a young age, a mother who struggled all her life for her only son, was now scared to lose him too. 
Throughout her life she didn't let him out of her sight, and now his career was taking him away from her. Although Elvis never stopped caring about his mother, in fact Elvis was devoted to his mother, and with his growing success he was only focused on providing his parents with all the luxury and comfort. Elvis purchased a mansion, Graceland in Memphis, to give his parents the best lifestyle, but even that place only intensified her despair. Her neighbours mocked how Gladys did laundry outdoors, and Elvis's handlers asked her to stop feeding her chickens on the lawn. Although Gladys enjoyed all the luxuries at first, now she was frustrated by the way her son's fame locked her in a gilded cage, unable to socialise normally with her neighbours. As his success grew, her fears increased. She started taking drugs. He had noticed that she had been taking some pills she was getting from the doctor, and that they were making her fretful and overactive in the house, always running around and cleaning. "'I'm putting on weight,' she told him when he caught her taking one. "'The doctor says these will help keep me slim. I want to be slim and pretty for you. I don't want you to be ashamed of me in front of your new friends.' He hated that she might even think like that. There was one thing she could be sure of, he told her. He would never be ashamed of her, and he never was. Gladys kept on taking the pills, which were what we would now call amphetamines, and drinking a little in the silence. He pretended not to see her drinking, because he never touched alcohol himself. He had been told that his grandfather Jesse had been an alcoholic, but he never thought to try himself. When he noticed how the pills gave Gladys energy, his mind clicked that this is the energy he needed for what he was doing on stage every night, and following the track of his mother, soon he began taking some himself. People see Gladys as the luckiest mother, while she believed that she was the most miserable. When Elvis was drafted into the army in March 1958, it was the onset of the end for Gladys's life. By the beginning of 1958 she was suffering from hepatitis. One day she told her cousin she was the most miserable woman on earth, and at one occasion she said in grief, I wish we were poor again, I really do. Elvis wasn't permitted to phone Gladys for his first two weeks in the service, and when he finally did get to call her, the two spent an hour crying together on the phone. When she spoke to Elvis on the phone, Gladys downplayed her increasingly bad health and unhappiness, so as not to upset him. Eventually, in early August of 1958, Gladys was admitted to Methodist Hospital in Memphis for a liver condition. Elvis immediately came back from Germany to see her. A few hours after he reached, he sank to his knees beside his mother's bed and wept. The only woman he loved was no more. It was August the 14th, 1958, when Gladys left the world, causing Elvis Presley to experience a great deal of grief from which he never fully healed. She's all I ever lived for. She was always my best girl, he cried. Witnesses recall him trying to get Gladys to wake up and talk to him. Elvis made sure Gladys's favourite band, the Blackwood Brothers, played at her funeral. Before she was buried, he gave her a last kiss, and in tears said, Mother, I would give every dime I have, and even dig ditches, just to have you back. Elvis had an inscription put on Gladys Love Presley's grave. Not mine, but thy will be done. Her grave was decorated with a cross and stone angels. Elvis sent fresh flowers to her final resting place every week, until his own death nineteen years later. Gladys Presley transmitted all her personality traits in Elvis that were visible even after her death. He was impulsive like his mother, he had everything he wanted at his fingertips, and he often acted impulsively, which sometimes makes a deadly combination. He developed an irrational need to spend money. He was only nineteen when he first shot to fame. With no one saying no to him on just about anything, it was only a matter of time before he began to overindulge. It was all too easy for him to slide into excess in everything, from food and drink to romantic flings and overspending. Elvis collected luxury cars and expensive guns, and he often acted without thinking. Self-indulgence became his outlet and, over time, his greatest enemy. Gladys Presley cast a large shadow in Elvis's life. When he met his future wife Priscilla, he talked frequently about Gladys. It was thought that he saw a resemblance between the two of them, and Priscilla would later note that Elvis's mother was the true love of his life. 
In a strange way, even Elvis's death aligned with his mother Gladys. Exactly 19 years after he buried Gladys, Elvis Presley died on the same date, August the 16th, 1977. The most loyal son, Elvis, brought his family back together at their last resting place. Gladys Presley, Elvis and Vernon are buried side by side at their Graceland mansion. If you enjoyed this video, you should definitely check this other video about the very special relationship between Elvis and his mother. I share how Elvis and his mother were so close that even Vernon Presley, Elvis's father, was occasionally shut out of the family.